So today is a special day because Jay is giving his finishing seminar. All of you know Jay. Sort of. Sort of. Jay Jay did his undergrad here. Even our esteemed ex-director has arrived. <laughs> I'm late. Sorry. Uh, Jay did his undergrad at Berkeley, and uh, he actually started at Berkeley before I did, and it was before I knew the politics of uh, trying to get an undergrad into. Berkeley's grad program, who actually did undergrad here. So uh, we circumvented all of that pretty quickly. And um, Jay's worked in probably one of my favorite places in the world, and he's done a, a really amazing body of work that um, has, I've been very envious of over the years, because my PhD started off some of this, and I knew there was a contact zone between these birds, but I never had enough time to find it. And so Jay found it, and he's extended the work a great deal. I won't go into too many stories about Jay. Uh, unfortunately, he has sufficient information on me. <laughs> that it probably wouldn't be wise. But I will just say one thing. Uh, Jay and I spent some time together in some of these mountains. And uh, many people have romantic notions about what field work is like. It's, of course, hard work. But the moment that sort of stuck with me is, was right at the end of the trip while we were packing up. The cook came to Jay and I and told us that he had worms. And so uh, that's how I tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> so over to you, Jay. <laughs> uh, I don't remember the cook saying that, so maybe I should get it checked out. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rory. Uh, and um, it's a real exciting thing for me to be able to give a talk in the MBZ. Uh, as Rory said, I was an undergrad here. And while I was an undergrad, I worked as a georeferencer in the MBZ. And I used to come into seminars here, uh, signed up for the seminar. I used to come in back when the screen was over there and everything was different in here. So uh, that tells you a little bit that I go back a pretty a long, long time. ways. Uh, <laughs> But it extends much further back than that, and far before I was born, so let me explain. So this is Dale McCullough, as we all know, who's sitting here, who got his, uh, his PhD in the MEZ in 1966, and then quickly went on to the University of Michigan right afterwards to start a faculty position. And uh, he was in the Department of Zoology, I believe. School of Natural Resources. School of Natural Resources. Regardless, uh, he was teaching a class uh, that was uh, a class for zoology majors where he had my dad as a student. And not only that, but uh, Dale used to um, have recruit undergrads to go count deer with him at the George Reserve. Uh, and he did a big study on the deer there over the course uh, of his time in Michigan. And he recruited my dad, and my dad thought it would be a romantic idea to bring along a young lady he was courting at the time. <laughs> uh, and as one of their first dates, they went out on one of these deer censuses. And this turned out to be my mom. <laughs> she emailed me to say her hands haven't warmed up since, so I guess it was 11 below uh, when I went out for this count. So every time I see Dale, I sort of have to think, okay, thanks, Dale, for going to get your hand and my parents, you know, budding romance. Uh, and thanks for the MBZ for joining Dale so that he could be there to make that happen. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to spend a lot of this talk uh, talking about social traits and speciation and social selection. So I thought instead of the birds of paradise, I would throw up some photographs of some taracos that have these very interesting uh, plumage traits, bright colors um, that are very different between closely related species, like this Fisher's taraco here and a Hartlob's taraco here. Uh, dramatic differences in these traits, really exciting looking birds, of course. And um, one of the things that I'd like to drive home about this is that uh, often when people talk about social selection and speciation, they bring up examples that are classic things of lots of dimorphism or dichromatism. Taracos are uh, monochromatic, monomorphic, and so both males and females have these social signals. And um, uh, I want to sort of remind people that even in things that are monomorphic, that don't sort of have obvious uh, dimorphism that would lead you to believe that there's a lot of social selection going on, it happens in most animals and it contributes to the way that things evolve and often contributes to speciation. Uh, so those of you who I've talked a lot with over the course of my dissertation in here probably saw this coming. 
This uh, is a quote from probably my favorite paper and one that had a sort of profound influence on the direction of my dissertation. Uh, Mary Jane West Eberhard's 1983 paper on social selection and speciation. It starts out with this quote, rapid divergence and speciation can occur between populations with or without ecological differences under selection for success in intraspecific social competition. And these are my italics here pointing out that social traits can change with or without ecological differences. And that it doesn't require uh, mate choice, intraspecific social competition can occur uh, in competition for other resources in addition to mates. And so that's important to think about when we think about social selection as well. <clears throat> so if you want to go out to a place where you could study a number of populations that were in isolation from each other and incurring very similar environment, you could do a lot worse than the eastern Afro-Montane. So here we are in East Africa. We're seeing part of Kenya and Tanzania here. <clears throat> and in this part of the world, we have this chain of mountains uh, that's broken up by flat areas in between them. And so there are a number of organisms, quite a few different organisms, that live in these montane environments and have these populations that are broken up in a sort of archipelago-like distribution. So we have a continental setting for these things that have very uh, archipelago-like distributions. And I'll just point out, this is a picture of my collaborator, Chacha Orema, who's standing in front of the Uluguru Mountains here. And the way that these mountains just sort of rise up out of the flat ground um, is, is really, really amazing when you see it in person. They're very, very discrete patches of habitat. Um, montane environments, often including forest, sort of uh, set on a savanna sea below. Uh, so, so the group that I'm going to talk about, um, and that Rory said, and as he said he started working on uh, during his dissertation, is the Eastern Double Collared Sunbird Species Complex. Uh, the genus is Nectarinia. So these are sunbirds, so they're nectar feeders, convergent on hummingbirds. They have these long, narrow bills that they use to procure nectar from the flowers. And as you can see, they're loaded with these sort of social traits that we're interested in. They have these really bright plumages. And as you'll see later, they have interesting songs. Um, so uh, just to give you a sort of idea of what it's like, what these, what these organisms end up being like in the field, a touch of natural history, um, I, I sort of think of these things as punching far above their weight. So they're really small birds, 6 to 13 grams, but they're sort of willing to take on any bird that's around. They're really territorial, fiercely territorial, and they're really loud. And, uh, and so they're um, analogous to hummingbirds in that way. You see hummingbirds attacking much larger birds some of the time. So there's another way in which they're uh, convergent. So <clears throat> this species complex is distributed from the far north of Kenya, a place called Mount Kual, uh, all the way down into southern Malawi and central Mozambique. And this is from Rory's work uh, in his dissertation work. It was published in the AUK in 2004. And he sequenced a mitochondrial gene and then did a gene tree. And what I want to point out from this slide is that um, these groups that are indicated here, A, B, C, D, E, and F, um, generally they come out as separate um, clades in the mitochondrial gene tree, with the exception of E and F, uh, which sort of come out together. <coughs> and these designations initially were at a subspecies level. A and B were each subspecies of a wider distributed species. And so uh, there's some indication from Rory's work that there was some differentiation going on here across uh, this environment in the eastern half of Montaigne among these isolated mountains. And one of the really exciting findings from this work that Rory was saying is that people hadn't uh, thought that this um, uh, group that's labeled C here, which is Nectarinia moroi, was in the Adzumba Mountains. And the Adzumba Mountains are a long sort of highland plateau with peaks topped by forests in southern Tanzania. And people had thought that only uh, a subspecies called Nectarinia uh, mediocris fulaborni was in the Udzungwa. It turns out both Moroi and fulaborni were there. And so that sort of set the stage for trying to figure out whether there was contact there. Uh, the other thing that was evident from this group is that we have these sort of deep branches in mitochondrial phylogeny. The plumages are quite similar. These are cartoon versions that sort of exaggerate the plumage features. But you can see that they all have this sort of red breast band with a blue or a violet breast band above it, and then green iridescent plumage on the head and back, and these yellow pectoral tufts you can see. So these are males, and this is basically what every female looks like. Uh, if you say that you can tell apart the females, then I don't believe you. I'd be very skeptical. They're very, very difficult to tell apart. Um, so we thought maybe this was a, a really interesting place to go look for how social signals might diverge in isolation. Um, and without many ecological differences. So very similar environments on these mountaintops. 
and then you're given this isolation by the fact that these mountain blocks are isolated from one another. Uh, so perhaps social, social selection, this is just this very simple model of how we're thinking about it, so, so social selection through time might drive different traits to fixation uh, in these different patches of habitat, uh, whether or not there are ecological differences between them. And you'll notice that I'm going to be talking about song here, so that's why there are music notes colored differently there. <coughs> So song makes for a really uh, interesting uh, social trait to study for a, a large number of reasons. Um, one of which is that uh, in, in these birds that I study, song is learned. So uh, part of the song phenotypes that individuals exhibit are learned from other individuals in the population. So there's an additional layer of complexity, if you will, to the, to the, to the evolution of these signals. Some of the best work on uh, how song diverges and uh, its role in speciation is from uh, the group that studies the cellular flycatchers uh, in the North Sea. And these are the songs of uh, two different species. And in areas where they hybridize, some individuals sing a mixed song that includes both syllables, uh, or sorry, both syllable types from the, from the pure parental songs. And it's, a, it's a important to keep in mind that there are two functions to song. One, uh, this is fairly generalizable across songbirds. One is males need to defend their own territories, and the other is that males need to um, uh, uh, attract females. And so um, song is prone to having really fast shifts. And part of the explanation for that for learned songs is that uh, cultural innovation can take place, um, uh, in, in imperfect copying can take place, and that allows for faster switches in learned song, um, presumably, than in uh, an in, in song. Um, and so as a, as a thing that might promote speciation, as a trait that might promote speciation, it has a capability to change very fast. But then when you get uh, different, different forms in sympatry, there's also the potential for this heterospecific copying to sort of uh, make things more similar when they come back into, into sympatry and not um, sort of solidify the boundary between species. Uh, so this is uh, meant to sort of be a method slide. So the first part of what I did was just go out and try to get to all of these different mountain blocks and make sound recordings, mostly not of people, um, but occasionally of people. And uh, we caught a lot of birds, and we took blood samples, and we took specimens. And, um, and made our way to all of these different clades uh, that Rory had identified from the mitochondrial gene tree. Uh, so I'm going to play you um, some of what uh, we first figured out. So this is the first two populations that I went out uh, were one population of uh, Nectarinia moroi and one population of Nectarinia fulborni. And if you remember, these are the two that look like they might come into contact <coughs> in the Azunga Mountains. Um, and so hopefully you can see from these sonograms, we have frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. There are some very obvious differences initially, one of which is that Fulaborni sings much longer songs uh, than Moroi does. And another is that uh, Moroi has uh, sort of tightly wound around a fairly small range of frequencies, whereas Fulaborni sings sort of up and down or up and down and covers a very wide frequency range. And so um, some people don't hear these differences all that well, so I've slowed this down to a quarter time so that people can get a better impression that exaggerates the differences between the species. Moroi song, you can sort of see this jumbled trill at the end where it's putting out a lot of notes in very quick succession right around the same frequency. <clears throat> um, I think you'll find Fulaborni has a much more pleasant sound. Uh, it's a little bit more relaxed. It separates out these elements into easily identifiable units uh, so you can hear it very well. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good singer. <laughs> uh, let me give you what it actually sounds like. 
not considerably longer. <laughs> uh, the song is very long by comparison, and if you've read music before, you might have been able to figure out that these uh, sort of uh, uh, more dark symbols here were those high frequency sounds. Um, uh, you can sort of read these sonograms across like that. <clears throat> Um, so these are these are data just from a, a simple MANOVA. Um, so I extracted uh, data from sonograms in a program called Lucinia, which is written by Robert Lachlan. A very useful program because you can uh, isolate each of these elements uh, in these songs automatically. It does it for you, and it does a very good job of it. Uh, and so the, the the data that I'm going to show you come from uh, isolating these individual elements and then uh, taking data from each of them and then sort of making summary statistics for songs as a whole, comparing them. <clears throat> uh, so I want to point out to you some of the things that are different and the same from these songs. So uh, <coughs> these uh, are what I'm calling fine-scale spectrotemporal structures. So uh, things like the mean pause duration from a song are very different between the two species. And after listening to it, hopefully you can recognize that the pauses in between elements are a lot longer in Fulborni than they are in Moroi. Uh, then there are things like the growth structure, uh, like the song duration is very different between the two species. And then uh, there's no difference in, in things like mean peak frequency. So uh, they're sticking around the same central frequency in the song um, throughout the song. Uh, and that um, sort of chalk up to uh, similarity to uh, inheritance. <coughs> uh, so uh, again, these, these, are, these are our songs. And so what I did well, after I sort of figured out that these things were really different from each other, I thought, well, all these other uh, clades that Rory identified in his mitochondrial gene tree, maybe they're all different as well. So I made my way around as many of these mountain blocks as I could um, in Tanzania and Kenya, and then later on in Mozambique. <clears throat> And uh, I sort of got on a roll in every single population I went to for the first few times. It was a different mitochondrial clade, it had a very different song. So uh, we'd show up in one place and I'd record a song. And it would be almost instantaneously evident most of the time that we were dealing with different song phenotypes for these different groups, which turned out to be concordant with um, a multi-locus tree. So this is just a, a schematic of a likelihood tree using five nu nuclear loci and a single mitochondrial uh, locus. And so completely concordant with the tree um, are these songs. And one thing to point out here is that we have this very cryptic uh, uh, morphologically um, uh, speciation event where we have uh, Mediocris up here and then what we're calling a new species in yellow here in the northern highlands in Tanzania. And uh, they come out different in this tree. And then um, the, the northern, Thailand, northern highland version in Tanzania has much, much longer songs. <coughs> So um, I'm sort of going to move on to the work on the contact zone now. And so I'm going to move further along in the Mary Jane West Everhart's abstract from this paper, uh, where she predicted a lot of things about the system. And I'm going to, going to talk about um, what happens at the parapatric boundary. So she says, maintenance of parapatric boundaries between socially selected species may sometimes be due to competitive exclusion and sympathy between populations whose primary divergence has been social rather than ecological. And I like this because it sort of gives an ecological perspective and brings in competitive exclusion uh, into this discussion about a species complex, what we normally think of as just a, a bunch of different populations that might be evolving pretty independently, and suggests that maybe um, we need to approach looking at the interaction between the two and their competitive interactions in addition to what happens on the molecular level uh, and whether or not they're uh, reproductively isolated from one another. So I wondered, is there competitive exclusion and sympathy where primary divergence between these two species has been social instead of ecological. And uh, this is a bit of an aside, but uh, we often forget that it was Grinnell who sort of first articulated uh, the idea of competitive exclusion. And by the time that he articulated it, he had thought that it was already axiomatic among biologists that competitive exclusion happened. And this is 17 years before Gauss published on Paramecia. It is, of course, axiomatic that no two species regularly established in a single fauna have precisely the same niche relationships. <clears throat> and uh, Dave wrote about this in 2009 uh, for a uh, uh, special edition of PNX. So uh, one way to look at the ecological uh, differences between these two species uh, is uh, to use a niche similarity test. 
which I did in a sort of now established way, um, using a background similarity test um, and biochem variables, seven biochem variables. I did niche model and accent, and then uh, compared the results uh, using EIM tools. So uh, basically what this test involves is taking the occurrence points and making niche models from occurrence points, and then also selecting a buffer around the occurrence points from which you take background points and you compare the niches that are um, modeled from the occurrence points to those that are modeled from the background points. <clears throat> and I'd like to point out here that uh, I put in these arrows because this is the distribution for Moroi, whose distribution, distribution points are all up in the northern part of the map here. And it makes some very, very specific predictions very, very far south of where it is that correspond to the occurrence points of Fulborni. It's a very powerful algorithm. <clears throat> Um, and so you make these uh, uh, null distributions from the background points to compare uh, the similarity values um, from the two species occurrence points. And uh, the story basically is that um, the similarity between the niche models developed from Moroi occurrence points and Fulaborni occurrence points are far greater than this, um, than this null distribution here. And so they appear to be uh, significantly more ecologically similar uh, in the background the environment of the places where they're located. <clears throat> so um, that gives us a, a one perspective, I guess is how I'd say, that, that abiotically they're occurring very similar environments, and this suggests that there's a uh, high level of ecological some similarity between the two, in addition to the fact that observationally we see them using many of the same flowers to feed from and that they're often occurring in uh, forests that have a very similar uh, community of other birds, so they're probably occurring in a very similar competitive, competitive environment. So what I did next was to sort of uh, use a, a set of samples along um, uh, this curve that I've drawn here, this red curve, to go to populations um, sort of along that line to look at what happens uh, when these two species come into contact and um, whether there's reproductive isolation. So um, Josh and I sequenced um, five nuclear loci and a single mitochondrial locus, and we plugged the results into structure. <coughs> and what you find is very interesting to me in that the nuclear, in the nuclear DNA, um, we appear to have just um, a few instances of individuals with mixed ancestry and uh, very little indication of any introgression. So, <clears throat> um, uh, more or less what that seems to say is that uh, there's very little hybridization going on, and despite <coughs> ample opportunity for there to be so, and I'll explain that later on, uh, there's also a, a little bit of mitochondrial and nuclear discordance here. There's three individuals that are um, fully one direction in nuclear DNA, and the other in the mitochondria. So what I wanted to know is, uh, are the clines and molecules and traits coincident? Um, so after going out and recording all these songs in different populations and getting all these molecular samples, um, this is a question that I could try to answer. So aspects of song have an alternate mode of inheritance, as I was saying before, so they culturally inherited. So uh, it's possible that where there's contact between the two, even though we don't have much hybridization going on or much successful hybridization going on leading to introgression, that the, um, the song phenotypes in contact would become more similar to one another and sort of flatten out the climb. <clears throat> uh, so I wanted to ask both of the, 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 do these have similar centers, the climb in molecular data and the climb in song data, and uh, do they have similar slopes? So I used a program called CFIT, uh, which um, was uh, uh, the paper that describes the method is from a 2008 um, issue of evolution, and it uses this model that was developed by Zimura and Barton in 1986. <clears throat> and what it allows you to do is to simultaneously uh, fit multiple traits, and so you can simultaneously fit phenotypes and uh, molecular types together at once and search for a common center and a common slope. So uh, I won't get too much into this, but the initial step is to look at each of the clients separately and uh, then examine what uh, the best model type was for, uh, for that trait and before moving on to trying to collectively define the center and the slope. 
And uh, I found that for both the genome data and the song data, uh, uh, the, what they call a unimodal model um, in the CFIT is the best fit model. And for uh, bill length, which is another character I dealt with, uh, it was a bimodal model with no introgression, but that was uh, within two units AIC, um, AICC of a unimodal model. So I proceeded using the unimodal model uh, to simultaneously um, define these clients. <clears throat> and sorry, I should have mentioned that uh, our genome character is the, is the result from the output from structure. Uh, so, so we're using the <coughs> probability of assignment to one of the populations as a continuous variable uh, to be modeled in CFIT. And Song, uh, I used a principal components analysis um, to look at the differences between species and then model that using the Klein. And then I measured the length of the on these new specimens. <clears throat> so then you do a likelihood search for a shared center and slope of the Klein's. And the long story short here is that uh, when you try to enforce a shared slope or a shared center, you get a less good model than when you have those parameters free for all of the different clients. So there doesn't appear to be a concordant center or concordant slope for the three clients. <clears throat> um, so when we look at the clients, I have to reorient myself because I've always thought of looking at this client from here, but the perspective is from here. So Morella is on the right and Fulbona is on the left. <clears throat> and these are very fresh results. Um, and so I encourage you to. Uh, to um, disagree with my uh, assessment of what's going on. Uh, but I think what we see is very interesting. So uh, looking across the entire climb from zero to 500 kilometers, uh, you can see this transition in the probability of assignment across space. Uh, it's very steep. Song, also very steep. And the bill length, not quite as steep. And you see more overlap um, among the two species, between the two species. Uh, so if we zoom in more and we look for the center, and we look at what's going on more towards the center of the Klein, uh, you can see what's going on a little bit better. And so the center of the Klein for um, the genome character, which is that structure probability, is uh, moved about three kilometers away from where the song Klein is, and the width of the genome Klein is more broad than the width of the song Klein. And so we have a, uh, a steeper slope for song and and. and um, and a center that's slightly removed. So I was showing this to uh, one of my colleagues, and he said, well, this isn't really a climb. That's just a line between two completely different forms. And, um, and <laughs> the reason that there's a gap in sampling here is because this environment is patchy. And uh, let me show you uh, how that looks. So th these, these populations are all color-coded on how I initially uh, uh, um, understood these populations to be distributed. And so we're looking here at all forests. The forests are color-coded, so those are 1,400 meters and higher forests in the Udzungo Plateau. <clears throat> and uh, I hope you'll notice the, um, the, the uh, scale bar there. So we're talking about a patchy environment where the distances in between these forests are not that large when you consider the dispersiveness of the birds that we're talking about. This is a distance of about seven kilometers between forest patches, and this is a distance of about five kilometers. And in this forest here, we have individuals that are pure Moroi individuals uh, among uh, many, many more Fulaborni individuals. So this population is dominated by Fulaborni, and then there are a few Moroi mixed in there. And we sort of encountered them all clustered in one spot. Uh, there's also a single Moroi individual that we recovered from here among 15 other individuals Fulaborni. So occasionally we get some Moroi mixed in with the Fulaborni here. Um, and we have this sort of patchy environment uh, that's somewhat setting the stage. <clears throat> so just going back to the structure plot here, that area that I pointed out where there's a one dot of Moroi in amongst the Fulaborni are individuals in this part of the structure plot. And you can see we get pure Moroi types amongst many Fulaborni <clears throat> in that area. So going back <coughs> to the song Klein and trying to explain why exactly we get a, a steeper slope and, um, and, a room, and a center that's moved slightly over from the genome climb. Um, there's uh, an interesting, well, so uh, I, I think part of what it explains this is this. You can see uh, in the genome climb that we have individuals here are individuals that are, um, that are pure Merola here. And one of these individuals is a blood sample we took from a bird that I successfully got some song recordings. 
and its song phenotype is down here. So you can see that this pure Moroi individual, uh, who is surrounded by mostly full of Boronite individuals, appears to have altered its song. Um, so compared to these uh, pure Moroi that are surrounded by other Moroi here, uh, it has a, a lesser value on the PC1 score, more similar to full of Boronite. And here we might be getting that circumstance, like I mentioned with this vesicula flycatcher example, where you have adjustments by males when they're surrounded by uh, heterospecifics, where the phenotype is plastic, and as a consequence, uh, we get Moroi songs that are more similar to full of one life in sympatry. <clears throat> if we look at the bill length cline, um, I haven't completely figured out how to deal with this yet, but we can see that uh, it's a bit um, broader than the song cline is, for sure. And the center is also moved over uh, 10 kilometers from where the genome climb is. Um, and this might be a consequence. It could be a consequence of local adaptation. It might be plasticity. I'm not sure exactly what to make of that. So one of the upshots of this uh, is that we have a, a scenario where we can stand in this forest, which is a Moroi forest. It's dominated by Moroi. Look across this narrow woodland gap five kilometer distance and see into the distribution of Fulaborni on this hillside uh, on the opposite slope. For birds, this is very unusual, um, I would contend. It might seem very normal to people who study salamanders and lizards, I would guess, <laughs> but uh, for things that can disperse 20 kilometers, perhaps, uh, this is a really, really narrow boundary. And one of the cool things about this is you can think, looking south here, you're seeing the furthest north Fulaborni population is on this mountain, a thousand kilometers of forest going south, every time you have a montane forest, you will find full of there effectively, anything above 1,400 meters. So from here, 1,000 kilometers south, all full of Bornai, and it comes to this very, very abrupt, the distribution comes to this very abrupt, narrow boundary where Moroi's population um, begins, Moroi's distribution begins. So this is a really sharp boundary, and, um, and so I'm sort of interpreting this, uh, again, in the sort of ecological framework and not purely according to sort of tension zone models where uh, the width of the climb is purely dependent on selection against hybrids and dispersal. Um, I think there's a lot of other things at work here. And so um, <coughs> there's a, a paper by Case and others from uh, Oikos in 2004 that discusses a lot of these different possibilities for what can make a boundary like this stable uh, and what can make it narrow. So these are factors promoting the stability of narrow parapatry when dispersal is high, which is the case with these birds. Um, and so one, one of which is that you could have an environmental gradient, and uh, that can uh, sort of maintain the stability of um, the boundary if uh, one species has an advantage on one side of the, of the boundary uh, versus the other. Uh, so. Uh, this seems like uh, it was a very difficult thing to discount, uh, but it seems very unlikely to me, and if there's an environmental gradient there, it's extremely subtle. Uh, this is an area where they're both uh, occurring at similar elevation, and this picture I showed you of the boundary between the two species here, uh, this occurs effectively along a single ridge uh, that's oriented exactly the same way and occurs the very similar abiotic conditions. There's nothing that suggests the community of individuals are surrounded by either birds or plants is very different on either side of this boundary. So this seems very unlikely that there's an environmental gradient. <coughs> uh, there's another possibility that interspecific competition is stronger than intraspecific competition. So the per capita effect of an individual of the other species on an individual of um, one species is greater than the effect of competition from intraspecifics. That's possible. <coughs> I don't have any data to talk about it, but it seems like a possibility in this circumstance. Ali effects are a third component, and um, Ali effects are likely to be acting here. If we think about um, individuals that like this cluster of Moroi that we have that's sort of on the wrong side of the boundary, they're going to have a tougher time looking for mates, presumably, than full of Bornai because they're greatly outnumbered. And so uh, at a low density, uh, there's a um, uh, disadvantage for those Moroi individuals who are on the wrong side of the boundary. Hybridization, if um, Hybrids uh, have lower fitness, can also contribute, and we see that there's some hybridization going on, and we see that it's very unlikely that those hybrids are having very much reproductive success because we don't get any introgression going on. So that's likely contributing. And then habitat patchiness, which we certainly have in this circumstance. 
um, is also contributing to how narrow this boundary is. So there's a final mechanism that isn't discussed in this uh, case at all work, uh, but is in um, uh, a paper that's somewhat related that Leithan talked about in here a few weeks ago. And that's that um, <clears throat> dispersal is not necessarily going to be random. And in this circumstance, we can think about how uh, if you think about from an individual perspective, say you're a male of one of these two species and you're born near the boundary, if you disperse across the boundary, you're very likely to recognize that you're not amongst your own kind. And so if dispersal is completely random, I would have expected to see a lot more individuals mixed, given how dispersive we think these birds are likely to be. We would have expected to see a lot more individuals um, coexisting than we do. And so I think one of the explanations here is that some individuals likely cross over to the other side of the boundary, and then they likely go back when they recognize they're not surrounded by conspecifics. Um, and that's an, idea, that's an idea I'd like to explore more. And one of, one of the reasons that this seems like such a plausible mechanism to me is that uh, these are altitudinal migrants, these birds are. And so you effectively have two mountains next to one another where these uh, species are distributed. And during the non-breeding season, they come down slope and very likely interact extensively with one another and then return back up slope to breed. And so I think it's extremely likely that um, these birds <coughs> often cross the boundary and then go back. All right. Um, so I'm going to move on uh, to looking at uh, how these birds respond to one another. And so we have this situation where hopefully uh, you recognize from this uh, from this climb analysis that the songs are very different from one another in very close proximity. And so I think it's very likely that these individuals have to interact with each other and are hearing each other's songs. <clears throat> and classically, when people have thought about social selection and speciation, they thought, OK, these traits are different. Let's look for how females might uh, uh, use that as a basis for a sort of mating. <clears throat> um, and often, people who are studying birds will use the male response to traits as a proxy and decide that, well, I assume that the females will do, will act similarly to how the males will. Um, so given <coughs> the, the ecological context of this boundary and some of the early results um, where I did a uh, pilot experiment, experiment and found that despite these huge differences in song, um, Full Born I reacted really, really strongly to Moroa songs. I mean, that was not something that I had expected. So I, uh, I decided to approach this from a more ecological sort of framework and thought about why individuals will respond. So I'm going to do playbacks, and this is thinking about why individuals might respond to signals um, of different organisms. And so this comes from a, a review by Payman and Robinson in 2010, uh, where they make this generalized prediction that the amount of resource overlap will determine the amount of territorial aggression uh, exhibited between species. And so you can think of uh, conspecifics are generally going to have very high resource overlap uh, with an individual, and heterospecifics are going to run from having very low resource overlap to very high resource overlap. <clears throat> and often from this uh, sort of speciation framework, we're really interested in we're thinking about signal similarity. And so we think as these social um, traits might change, that individuals <coughs> might respond much less to them if they're very dissimilar from their own trait or very dissimilar from those um, of their own species generally. Um, and so there, there's sort of two different ways to approach this question, and uh, sort of two different frameworks to make predictions. And you can be wrong either way. There are instances where you'll have relatively low resource overlap, but high signal similarity. And you might get lots of territorial aggression um, because of mistakes in recognition, not, collectively rec or not correctly recognizing uh, that an individual doesn't have very much resource overlap. <coughs> Uh, with oneself. Uh, conversely, we might have circumstances where there's very high resource overlap and where individuals can discriminate between the signal of um, conspecifics and the signal of the heterospecific. <clears throat> and there we might get territoriality with heterospecific categorization so that an individual might recognize that something is not a conspecific but still react very strongly to it. So we have this nice circumstance in this group that I'm studying where we have a contact zone, where we have two different forms coming together, and then we have populations that are distant from that contact zone. And I think this makes a really interesting uh, circumstance to test these um, hypotheses about how things are likely to react. Here where we have contact, we have uh, very what looks to be a very similar um, 
ecological species uh, that has a very different signal. So we might get some of this heter uh, correct heterospecific categorization and still get very strong territorial responses. We're distant from the contact zone. Uh, we might not see that because of a lack of recognition of the heterospecific signal, <coughs> even though it would be a strong competitor if it was closer. So what I did is run a transect of playback experiments to territorial males. So I played songs uh, of, of three different species to each individual, to each subject um, in the playback experiment. And I did so in this sort of transect across the contact zone. So I looked at these five populations here, A, B, C, D, and E. And these pies represent how much of each uh, species is represented um, at each location. So one of the populations is where we had a few of those Moroa individuals around, and uh, we, had, we also recovered one hybrid. <coughs> so I used three song stimuli, like I said, conspecific song, a heterospecific song, meaning the other species, so for a full morna, that would be a Moroa song, and a control song, and for the control, I used a sunbird that's sympatric with these other sunbirds uh, in all of these different populations. So it represents this ecological control where it's presumably in some degree of competition with these two species, um, but <coughs> represent as much of a competitor um, as one of the closer related birds. So just to show you, we have these different song types again, Moroi, Polaboni, and we have an all the sunbird as the, um, as the control signal, which is quite different from Moroi and Polaboni signals. <coughs> And I used a repeated measures design, like I said, for each subject. Uh, it heard each of these three stimulus and had a chance to respond to each. So I want to know, do territorial males generally exhibit discrimination of conspecific versus heterospecific song? Are they responding more strongly to their own song than to the heterospecific, where we have this huge difference between the songs? <clears throat> and if you look across all populations, what you see is that uh, both species responded more strongly to the conspecific song than they did to the heterospecific song um, at this level, uh, looking at all populations. But what we're interested in is decomposing uh, this response, these responses geographically so we can look at each population separately. <coughs> so here for population C, where we presented songs to Folaboni individuals, we identified by plumage and song before we uh, set up the um, experiment. We get strong response to both the conspecific and the heterospecific signal. This on the y-axis is the difference in the response uh, to the conspecific minus the heterospecific. So a value at zero indicates no discrimination. So we have uh, uh, similar responses to Folaboni song as to Moroa song in population C here at the contact zone. And if you compare that to population D, just on the other side of the contact zone, uh, we get a little bit of what looks like to be a little bit of discrimination of value greater than zero. So I'm curious what happens, of course, when we move away from the contact zone. <clears throat> and what you see is that in population B, as you move away from the contact zone, we get a very limited response to the heterospecific distant, and therefore maybe these individuals are not familiar with the heterospecific song and are unlikely to respond. Uh, we get a similar trend on the other side of the contact zone between B and E. Uh, but that difference is not significant. So um, moving away to a third population, and you're going to see briefly why uh, I really like the idea of spatial replication before I did this experiment, and then I decided I didn't like it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> we get um, a, a response that's uh, not different uh, statistically. A and C did not respond in a way that was statistically differentiable. Um, so we get uh, 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 one population that has uh, very solid discrimination between the two species, and then two that have much less in full of Orna. And so um, uh, this is a little complex to, to understand, um, but uh, I, the, I'll explain the way I'm interpreting it. So we get a species level, both Moroi and full of Orna show discrimination of conspecific versus heterospecific songs, but there's geographic variation in that. So strong heterospecific responses by Fulaborni at the contact zone, I think, are likely maintained by interactions between the two species. So either through selection for a strong response to the heterospecific, because it means a lot to be territorial against an individual with a different song, it's, it's a strong competitor, <coughs> or uh, learning songs in, uh, in sympatry, so where individuals can hear the song 
a competitor learn that it's associated with that competitor and that will, strong, uh, will respond strongly. Uh, there's a third aspect to that. If there's some more introgression, perhaps, that we didn't pick up in the molecular work that we did, part of this could be explained by that as well. Um, uh, explaining what happens distant from the contact zone is more challenging, of course. So fairly strong responses to heterospecifics distant from contact, I think, suggest a role for stochasticity and the loss of territorial response. So you can think very different, very distant from the contact zone. Individuals have no experience and uh, with the heterospecific songs. So uh, the, the heterospecifics might as well um, not really exist. And so when you introduce this heterospecific song into their environment in a playback experiment, you're doing something that doesn't ever happen to them. And so uh, in that way, you could sort of think about the selection for them to not respond, <coughs> to discriminate and not respond, is likely not there. It's likely very low. <coughs> um, so uh, lastly, uh, I, I would recommend for any comparison of playbacks that spatial replication is included. Uh, people go out and do these experiments quite a bit where they're comparing zones of sympatry with zones of empathy. And uh, it appears that the, the uh, the way that uh, responses evolve is much more complicated than can be appreciated uh, if you just look at two populations, which people often do. <coughs> Miraculously, I finished in time. <laughs> uh, so there were a huge number of people who contributed to this work, and I'd really like to thank the MBZ community generally. Uh, this has been a spectacular place to work. I'd also like to say I don't consider this the end of my finishing talk. I would like to consider this part one, and I plan on explaining the rest of it in a, second, uh, in a second finishing talk. But I might as well thank all of the very relevant people, uh, the people who helped um, uh, to a sometimes ridiculous degree with this work. Uh, I'd like to point out a couple individuals in particular, uh, Josh Penalba did a huge amount of the molecular work and was a fantastic person to work with. As most of the people in the museum already know, um, I really thanks Josh. It was uh, fantastic um, to be doing this work with you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my two research assistants <coughs> um, who were in the field with me all the time. And this happened to me before. I was getting choked up when I was practicing talking about these guys, so I'm going to skip over them. <laughs> so. <coughs> If you ever, if you ever wondered what Rory might look like just after thinking he was going to get mauled by a black this, this, this picture tells this picture tells you what that would look like. So we were at Sage Hen for a, a, a lab retreat, and we devised a scheme that uh, Andrew and I would take Rory into the, the fish shed and spend some time looking into the river and looking at the fish while all the other members of the lab grab the stuffed bear and place it immediately outside the door of the fish shed. So we managed to keep Rory in the fish shed for a really long time. And I remember we talked about We talked about all sorts of different stuff. He didn't really have any clue what was going on. Went up the stairs, uh, opened the door, and looked out. And like an ornithologist would, completely ignored the bear initially and was looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the bear was about three feet away from him. So Andrew was coming up just behind him and had to say, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> to, to grab Rory's attention, at which point Rory looked at the bear, uh, nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, might, I might as well say now, in case I don't get a chance to do another talk, it's been fantastic to work with you, Rory, and I really appreciate taking a chance on me when you had never met with me, uh, taking a chance on me as a student, and, um, and it's been a pleasure working with you. I've really appreciated all of the enthusiasm uh, that you've shown for my work and support for my work. Um, so with that, I guess I'll wrap up. And we'll be happy. be really dynamic though, right? I mean, there's no reason to think that the one that exactly where it is now is where it's always been in the last um, thousand years. I completely and, agree. And so if you had other other populations of the one species invading the other one, mm -hmm. then that might explain why you have such a difference um, in the playback experiment. Mm 
different places. Uh -huh. So, so um, I, I, I agree. I think that the, um, the potential for there uh, to be movement with this contact zone is really high because it, given where it's positioned, it seems very unlikely that it's really stable there long term. Um, I, I had that discussion with my committee several times, and I think that we all had a different perspective on it. So uh, I would say after, after reading up about these different models that try to account for stability, uh, you know, the elements are there for it to have a relatively strong stability. So, um, so maybe it's not moving, maybe it is, and that's something I really wanted to sort out with molecular data. I tried some Bayesian skyline plots to look at whether Fulaborni had a signature of expansion through time. Mm -hmm. uh, got nothing out of that, and I think that's likely because of the gene flow between these populations. Um, it, it might obscure the signal even if that is the case. But um, yes, it's very possible that Moroa used to come right up here as well, for sure, and Fulaborni has pushed it back over time. That could explain part of the response. Is there another species, St. Patrick? I don't really know what the scale is with, from your original ranges, but is there another species possibly that sounds like Moroi or closer to it that is closer to the A population that would make them respond more strongly? Uh, not, none that we've encountered. So, you know, I did a lot of recording here, and so if there was something singing there that was similar, um, it was singing at a different time of year than when I went, and I, I think it's very unlikely that there's something that's really similar. Uh, sort of to relate a question. First of all, does the the Fulbright, or the Moroi, does that extend far north? And and then also, um, have you looked at the sort of ecological differences as you go further into the ranges? And does that maybe so that maybe give some insight into if there are ecological differences? Uh, so Moroi extends um, not that far north. Um, it has so I'm flipping through these. Uh, it, it has a fairly narrow range, um, and so it gets replaced as you move north um, by other species in the species complex. So um, it's uh, maybe 300, 400, 500 kilometers further north, you can find it up here. So um, the, the uh, niche similarity test I did included points from all of these localities. And so I, I really strongly think after going to these places, uh, one of the things that really strikes you when you're in these environments and you're recording birds is that you, you encounter the same species over and over and over and over again. And the similarity between the species that you find uh, like in a forest here to what you find here, they're, they're very, very similar places. Um, and so that, that's, that's the story for me at this point. And, sorry, I think I missed the second part. Of yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So I'm intrigued by this your observation that, that these things move down and perhaps occur in mixed, well, there's a lot more mixing in the non-breeding season. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really dumb question, I'm a herpetologist. I guess the, the learning of song is really neonatal, or could there be any right. further modification of song types when they're sort of moving down, at least as <coughs> first year birds or something? Yeah. Down to the, so this, this the isn't a system. Well, so Darwin's finches, are, uh, people know fairly well, learn from their fathers. And uh, that's not um, all that common among the songbirds. And these certainly don't appear to be that way because the fathers of the, the social fathers of the nest stop singing when they start feeding the nest. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not learning from their father unless they do so at a later time. Uh, and they stop singing, and it, it appears, based on my experience in the field, that they'll stop singing for about nine months. So the singing period is fairly brief, and I was very lucky, lucky to have showed up when they were singing every time I went to the field. Um, I had I hit a couple uh, populations where they weren't singing, where I just timed it wrong. Um, so those individuals that are young are probably learning over the course of one or maybe two years. Okay. And given the complexity of the, of the songs, I think it's likely that they spend a long time learning the song. The other additional aspect of that is that when you go out and miss net, and you try to miss net uh, an individual who's singing, <coughs> you end up capturing, if you use playback, five other males. So they have these territories. They're not ex really exclusive territories because there are all these individuals who I presume are young individuals who haven't established a territory yet who are sort of moving through the undergrowth. So I think there's um, a long period of time where individuals are likely to have a chance to continue to learn songs before they're able to um, take a territory. So there are a lot more males in our territory. It seems like a lot of your interpretations about this pattern, based on uh, there being high dispersal. Yes. Is there direct evidence for dispersal? 
So, um, I, th I think there's, there's, there's two ways uh, that I've thought about this, and, and one of them is that every single one of these mountains, no matter how isolated throughout this distribution, you find these birds. And so they get out to all of these distant places. Now, climate change in the past could have made the areas in between what are presently isolated patches of habitat uh, corridors for dispersal. Uh, but that's sort of one source of evidence. The other is that um, there was a bird that was captured and um, was recaptured nine kilometers away. Uh, and there's very little banding that goes on in this area, so it was a very fortunate um, instance. So there, uh, an individual from this population about here was recovered nine kilometers away. The other thing is that in, um, in the structure plot, uh, you see this, this individual here, um, you know, is in amongst yeah. Only the individuals of the other species. We 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 found we recorded no songs of morelli in this population, and only caught this one individual, the first individual we caught there. Uh, you know, it shares some alleles with these populations that are 25 kilometers away. So I think I think it's really unlikely that they're not moving around a lot in the environment. Although once they get to a territory, they appear to stay there uh, because we've recited individuals that we've color banded in successive years in the same territory. How far did they move down slope? Um, I'm not exactly sure, but I think um, the lowest records are about 700 meters or 600 meters uh, in the Uluguru Mountains, and they appear to uh, breed at no lower than about 1,400 <coughs> meters. So they're moving you know, maybe as much as 1,000 meters down slope. In the context of this contact zone, um, <coughs> one of the areas that uh, where we have samples from that I didn't include um, is a forest that's below 1,400 meters. So often it's not forest that's at the lower elevation, but there's a forest in between these two areas uh, where at the contact zone where you have Moroa and Fulvorna meeting. And uh, Rory has samples of, of both species from that lower elevation forest. So I mistakenly went once uh, when uh, the individuals hadn't sort of returned to higher elevation, and you encounter Moroa at least outside of the forest, on the forest edge, and all these different places, uh, and not very much at higher elevation during those periods of time. So it's, I think it's a really substantial amount of movement. Related to that, given that you have all this evidence for a lot of dispersal, it seems strange that the that their ability to recognize heterospecific songs drops off so quickly beyond the, the uh, contact. Mm -hmm. I think that would be much more gradual <coughs> drop off if there was all that dispersal going on. Not a lot of habitat, so I think there's only those forests right at that boundary. Everything is this, this the one species further south, so I don't think they penetrate very far. Well. If if it's selection that's mm -hmm. maintaining that, though, I guess it uh, you know it is possible that those alleles would move into those populations that are further away. And I think that that was an open possibility to me, for sure, when I was doing the playback experiments. Um, and I considered that a sort of likely hypothesis. Um, but if they're learning, then obviously when they drop up, it's going to be a lot steeper. So if they're learning the heterospecific song, then the drop ups are very fast. I mean, one of the other interesting things with this system is <coughs> from, from pollen core data, we know that some of these forests have been where they are for at least 40,000 years. How long, sir? 40,000. And how, how old is the split between those two? Uh, from the mitochondrial DNA, they're about 4 to 6 percent divergence, so um, that's 2 or 3 million years. Yeah, I, I don't know if I missed this. Did you see um, color differences between the hybrids and the, the original populations? I haven't done the measurements. Um, I. So the, the individuals that were hybrids, the strange thing about these birds is they're harder to tell apart in the hand than they are when you see them flying around. Um, probably because of the way they position their wings when they're in the hand covers up some of the yellow at the sides of the breast that you can use to distinguish one species from the other. So when we had birds in the hand, we had a really difficult time when it looked like there were individuals of both species present telling them apart. So I think it's likely that the hybrids have um, an in-between phenotype. And there were a couple instances where I saw a bird flying around and I thought, wow, if there's a hybrid phenotype that's intermediate between the two, then that's it. But they look so similar to begin with that it's really difficult to tell. And did you see any uh, change in the color, in the song pattern, in the hybrids? So 
uh, many of the recordings that we have, so one thing I didn't talk about is that um, those songs that we recorded that appear to be shifted towards Full of Bornai, and that had Morelli plumage, so they look like pure Morelli individuals, and that one individual that we had the sample for that we can say is a pure Morelli type, they were really crappy songs. So like they, they didn't resemble Full of Bornai all that much, so they scoot more towards it on that principal component axis. Um, but they're likely really poor songs, as in the, tr the trill rates are very low compared to what a Morelli trill rate would look like. They look very different from the species typical songs. So the first thing we thought when we found these birds, we saw them, uh, well, we visually identified a couple of these Morelli surrounded by full of Ornai, and then we're really desperately trying to record them. They don't sing very often, and they sing really, they often sing these really sort of meek, low-pitched songs, or low-volume songs. Yeah, you've got a mechanism for your hybrid. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's likely that um, it really compromises the song phenotype, both the contact itself, individuals uh, sort of in a density dependent situation where they're surrounded by heterospecifics, their song phenotype might be sort of compromised, as well as hybrids. Okay, people, I think we stopped there. I could keep you here all day. <laughs> but, uh, thank you very much, Jay. That's great. Nice job, Jeff. Thanks. 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 Thanks.